I'm here to talk about some, some research that my group is doing around this theme of uh, sensing and data science. And really, like, science advances with availability of new data, right? Science advances when we are able to see, measure, observe things that we couldn't do before. And then we can kind of learn from this new data we collect. So what I want to give to you today is two examples of, of work we've been doing at uh, this uh, uh, frontier where new sensing capability is becoming available. And one will be around personalized health uh, and, and obesity, and the other one will be about big complex machines uh, that uh, we are building, uh, building, like cars, airplanes, things like that. So first, uh, health, right? We are uh, carrying these sensors, uh, smartwatches, cell phones um, in our pockets uh, all days long. Um, around 70% of adults in, in developed world have uh, smartphones and around 50% in the developing world, right? And there is a lot of sensing about our physical activity and so on that is happening, but this data, you know, the analysis we see and science we see out of this is kind of they tell you that when there is an earthquake, people tend to wake up. Right, and things like that, right? So the question is, can we use this to do, um, to learn something about human, human health uh, and so on? And where, how we started this work was to ask, okay, how much do we know about exercise um, and physical activity? It's an embarrassing how little we know. Just as an example, if you ask WHO, uh, you know, what's the level of physical activity in Germany, they will tell you that between 5 and 54% of Germans don't get enough physical activity, right? So that's the confidence interval. And, and, you know, for Switzerland and Israel, there is no data. We don't know, right? And, and, right, these are not some third world countries. These are all excellent countries with excellent health system. We don't know. So we actually pa created partnerships with uh, local companies, um, Azumio and Under Armour, who gave us data uh, for open, free uh, research. And we said, okay, can we use this data to see what can we learn from it? So we have data for around uh, 5 million people, uh, all over the world, 160 uh, million days of step tracking and activity tracking, about 230 billion different data points. And uh, this is an example uh, of the of the app and the, the data logging uh, uh, service where people would keep track of their daily activities, steps, sleep, coffee intake, and so on and so forth. So the first thing we did, we simply said, what is the average number of steps people in a given country do per day? Uh, and here is the physical activity of the world uh, with the colors denoting the activity. And you can see that, for example, how, uh, a, let's say, Asia, China, Japan seem, are more active, and then this kind of Africa, like North Africa and so on, and then uh, um, uh, Southeast Asia, they are uh, less, uh, less active. But this is, it's not only about average levels of activity, you can go much, much deeper. So we can start asking, how is the activity distributed among the population in a given country. So here I'm showing you four example countries, Japan, United, United Kingdom, United States, and Saudi Arabia, and these are the distributions of activities. So number of steps per day, and then fraction of people with that number of activity. And you see how, you know, Japan is to the right, so they have higher level of physical activity, and uh, Saudi Arabia and US are down to the, to the left. But what you also notice, if you look at this more carefully, is that the width of these distributions is different. So if I align these distributions uh, that, so that they all pick at the same uh, position, you see how the distribution of activity is much more narrow in, in Japan, and then in uh, US and Saudi Arabia is much wider. So you can start asking about how evenly or how unevenly the, the physical activity is distributed among the population. So you can start thinking about what's the difference between activity poor and activity rich people. And the same way, um, and you can basically go and quantify the unevenness or spread through this notion of a Gini coefficient. And you can start talking about what is the level of activity inequality in the society. And what you find, which is amazing, is that this notion of activity inequality is really well associated with the fraction of obese people in a given country. And uh, the association is much, much stronger than what it would be if you would just say, you know, how well does the average activity correlate with the physical, uh, with the amount of obesity. But it's really about, you know, in some sense, how wide is this distribution and how many, uh, how many activity poor are in the country, and that relates well with, uh, uh, with the obesity, where, you know, leaders are United States, Saudi Arabia, and so on, and then, you know, on the obesity scale, and then, you know, China, Japan, and so on, are very low in terms of obesity. 
What is interesting is that you can also find the, uh, one of the main causes of this activity inequality is the gender gap. So what I'm showing you here is Japan, United Kingdom, United States, and Saudi Arabia, and separate activity distribution for men and women. And you see how uh, in Japan, men and women are about equally uh, uh, active. While you go to United States and, United, um, and uh, Saudi Arabia, the gap uh, widens quite a lot, right? So men lose a bit of physical activity, but women are kind of the vulnerable population, and they are the ones who lose the most in terms of physical activity, and this gap is created. So what you can then ask is, how can, I, how can we fight this? And the way we can uh, fight this is to say, OK, can we see how our cities are designed? Um, and to show you that the design of the city really affects how much we walk, I'm showing you that now only United States cities. The top is uh, time of the day over the weekday. Um, the bottom is time of the day over the weekend with the amount of physical activity. And what you see that in high walkability cities like New York, San Francisco, you have these spikes, you know, at something around 9 a.m., around lunchtime and in the afternoon of physical activity, while in low walkability cities you don't see that. Uh, you also see, interestingly, the same, the difference also happening over the weekend, right? Um, and you can actually really well establish how the design of the city accessibility of um, of public transport and so on affects our physical activity. So we can actually build these models that say, based, based on, ba let's say we improve the design of the city for one point on the walkability scale, you know, who would, benef who would benefit and how much. So here are different, you know, buckets of people, both male and female, and you can see that everyone would benefit. And what is important is that you see also obese and overweight people would benefit, not only, let's say, young um, and, and uh, normal weight people, right? So it allows us to build these models and start understanding how does the design of the cities, access to parks, groceries, uh, supermarkets, and everything else, how it affects uh, the design. So that's the first thing I wanted to do, and I was hoping to be at five minutes, but I'm at nine. So uh, I'll show you the second thing uh, we are working on, right? Another place where kind of we have lots of data, but it's very hard to understand, are these, are these types of machines we are building, cars, aeroplanes, and so on, right? And you have these thousands of sensors, and it's very hard to understand what's happening. Uh, we'll be working here with about 2,000 hours of, uh, you know, students driving in Germany being paid to collect the data, about 100,000 uh, kilometers of driving, uh, around uh, 600 sensors. Uh, we are doing the same things on airplanes that have about 20,000 sensors. Uh, and the problem is that, right, this data is kind of passively collected, and we have no ground truth data what is happening to the car while the car is driving. So the question is, can we build any kind of understanding or capture the, the state of the car, right? Like, can we kind of aggregate all this information coming from all these heterogeneous sensors into some kind of low-dimensional state that would tell us what's the state of the car? And we have come up with this uh, um, neural network architecture that's uh, based basically on kind of auto-encoding auto and kind of compressing information. But the key insight is that when we are trying to do this and detect the state, the way we define the state is to say state is something that is predictive of the future, but it's not only predictive of the future, let's say, one, one second into the, into the future, but actually also one minute into the future, half an hour into the future, and so on. So we want to build this state that will this, this short dimensional vector that will predict the state of the car at many different kind of scales or granularities uh, into the future. Um, and if we, if we apply this, we can, for example, go from this 64 dimensional description to predict the exact values of all these 660 sensors one second into the future uh, very accurately. But you can also predict the values of the sensors, let's say, 100 seconds uh, into the future also very accurately from the same uh, 64 dimensional representation. What this allows us also to do is to, for example, do various kinds of tasks. One thing we said is, can we, based on this, where we try to predict the values of the sensors, can we identify the driver? We have 30 drivers. If you would be guessing the driver, you know, you'd do that with um, F1 score of around uh, 5%. We can do that with 74% accuracy, right, without even trying to learn how to identify the driver. Um, we can also, for example, take all the, dri all the drives and, and embed them in this low-dimensional space and start labeling them. So here we put some effort to hand-label a few. And you see that, for example, here is hard braking. These are the turns. 
these are the gas pedal, um, when people slam the gas pedal, and so on and so forth. And you see other clusters that you could go and label. And then the other thing we can do is that we can use this to predict future um, actions of the driver. So for example, will the driver slam the brake a tenth of a second into the future? Here's our AUC score, right? The, 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 the prediction task is heavily unbalanced, but we can do it with 0.9999983, right? Um, and then we can also understand kind of how people drive and how they are changing the states as they go, let's say, from highways to local roads um, and so on. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>